boy, I promise you, this show is jam-packed. Mike, a friend of ours on Facebook here, asked a question at the end of today's show. Doug, I have rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, and it went on and on. He's polysymptomatic, many symptoms. What might be contributing to that? So at the end of the show, we'll address that. Before that, Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease. What might be the cause? Did you know certain fungi produce poisons that are tremorogenic? We're gonna discuss that. Suzanne Giliotti is a registered nurse friend of mine who had a horrible mold problem. She's gonna be here today talking about that. And what happens when she cheats? Guess what happens? Finally, autoimmune disease and infection, there's a link. What does every infected patient get? Watch. For the past 45 years, I have dedicated my life and my whole career to finding the root cause of disease. And I now know with certainty that we must play a role in our own health care. I'm a self-care advocate. You know what? Every time you change your diet for the better, exercise, or swallow a nutritional supplement, so are you. Now welcome to Know the Cause. You know, I talk about the immune system a lot, and I, I uh, link things back to fungus. About 300 species of fungi make a poison. These are called mycotoxins. Myco denotes fungus, right? Mycology is the study of fungus. So these mycotoxins, and there's a couple thousand of them, because each of the 300, like Aspergillus, makes several of these mycotoxins, and they're bad guys. And I've tried to impart this knowledge through the years that we're very commonly in contact with some of those 300 fungi. Penicillium is the mold, and one of the mycotoxins it makes is called penicillin, handed out to billions of us all the time, right? So just remember that, you know, plant that seed in the brain and think about this. Here, a couple of years ago, on January 6, 2017, sciencedaily.com, I like that website, reported this headline. Doctors are on the trail of a possible connection between autoimmune diseases and infections, okay? You read that headline, if you're anything like me, and you go, okay, doctors are on the trail of a possible connection between uh, autoimmune diseases and infections. Are you going, you're, you've been watching this a long time. We've been on the air 22 years. I had dark hair when we started this. Infections, that would beg this question. Here's where I want you to look at headlines from now on. Think logically. What does every infected patient get? Bingo, mycotoxins. They get antibiotics and they can be life-saving. I have no ax to grind with the prescription of antibiotics when it's done judiciously. Unfortunately, and they support me on this, I don't think antibiotics are handed out very judiciously. At the right time, in the right hands, I think they can be life-saving. Did you see the headline here? I brought it to you on TV maybe last year. 81% of the antibiotics that dentists hand out aren't necessary. 19%. Man, did you ever get a 19% on an English test in high school? What did that give you, an A? Okay, you're with me, an F. What does every infected patient get? Are you seeing where I'm going with this? Okay, so the next graphic will even make more sense to you, and here it is. It's important to note that almost all mycotoxins suppress our immune system, although the exact target of the immune system may differ. Isn't that fascinating? Most mycotoxins made by these fungi have immunosuppressive effects. Um, they lower your immune... Look, the COVID caught us off guard. Right? So many of us have our immune system down. As we age, the immune system dips naturally. And all of a sudden, we become vulnerable to any bacterial infection, any viral infection, anything going on. The game that I have learned in life is to keep your immune system developed. Check with a Petri dish to see if you have mold in your home. Don't drink alcohol, which is a mycotoxin. Stay away from corn and wheat and peanuts as best you can because those products, those foods, are sometimes impregnated. Sure, even in America, sometimes impregnated with this mold. Okay, so to build strong immunity, you must stop suppressing it. Okay, 
Do you even have your tonsils anymore? How many years ago were those taken out? These are immune tissues in your body, just a seed to plant. Have you been washing your hands 20 times daily with antibacterial soap for 20 seconds each cleaning, folks? That's what we went through not long ago, right? Some of us are still doing it. Know that God put bacteria all over your skin. Antibacterial soaps, you figured that out, right? Uh, to build strong immunity, you must stop suppressing it. Do you take a round or two of antibiotics annually? Do you take more? Some people take antibiotics three, four, five, six times a year because they keep getting sick. That's because your immune system is dipped. How do you get it up? You know, here's one way. Since sometimes our alcohol and grain supply are impregnated with fungal mycotoxins, how are you doing with your diet? Bread, pasta, bagels, alcohol. I had to think through that many, many years ago when I got back from Vietnam, 1971, and I turned to alcohol. Folks, they called it back then post-traumatic stress, but no one knew how to work with it. And I found alcohol calmed the savage beast inside of me. A pop or a bang didn't scare me anymore if I had an alcoholic drink in me. That was a little crazy, but this is the new me. At my age of 70, I feel better than I've ever felt just by following some simple rules to help my immune system. Let me tell you a little story of how God has worked in my life. A couple of years ago, I give a lecture. It's to doctors, continuing medical education, and I was the keynote speaker. So I got to dinner time, get up there under the chandelier and speak. Doctor, I met a physician who's a pulmonologist, and he told me afterwards, this, your lecture changed my world. I thought everything was bacteria, and I've been treating it as such in the lungs. Two years later, I meet a nurse. You're going to meet her right now. Suzanne Giliotti is a registered nurse with a master's degree in nursing who sometime later met that pulmonologist because she had, excuse me, but coughed up an aspergilloma or a, or a piece of aspergillus <clears throat> mold from her lung, and she was extremely sick. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us. How many... Okay, did you question this whole thing? Let's go back 10 years ago. Okay. You're kind of allopathically trained, take this medicine. Yes. Uh, working in a big hospital. The hospital had an air conditioning problem. How many of the nurses, when you went back, or the doctors, and said, look at my report, I have mold in my lungs. How many of them said, wow, that's serious, uh, good for you? For, or how many of them said, it's no big deal? Uh, first question would be zero. <laughs> Uh, the second question, I already forgot, but it's... <laughs> so it's that it's that brain. You no, it is. I, have... I have been diagnosed with a mild cognitive impairment because of this mold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so... and I have some days are better than others, but yeah, this is a very. It's embarrassing on one hand, but it's a really good example how rapidly that happens. But can you see now, Suzanne, how because of my lecture and John remembers my producer of seventeen years. I really didn't want to go, but it was local, and it was a free dinner, so I went. And look at how that information was imparted on a bunch of doctors. One of them happened to be in Texas, and you met that doctor. When the emergency room, or the emergency doctor you saw, saw that mold, did you say, what's mold? What is aspergillus? I mean, were you trained in nursing school? No, I had no idea what the significance was. And had I listened to like the first, I don't know, 10 people that I mentioned it to, and that's being generous, yeah. I would have done nothing about this because everybody had the same thought about it, that it's just, it's ubiquitous, it's contamination from the lab, they didn't handle your specimen correctly. Um, yeah. It's you're, you're just colonized with it, it's your normal flora. And I did not understand until I further educated myself how bad things really were and how sick I really was. How did you, did you go back to books? Did you go on the computer? How did you find the cause? How did you begin studying this? Through <clears throat> Dr. Soraya, who became my treating pulmonologist, he explained to me how you had changed his practice because as a nurse seeing a doctor but as a patient I put him through the rigors as most nurses do and I asked him about his paradigm and because it didn't make sense to me he was talking about glutathione and supplements and it kind of freaked me out and he explained to me about Doug Kaufman 
So of course, mm -hmm. the first thing any good nurse does is she Googles everything Doug Kaufman. Uh -oh. And that's, that's how my journey to wellness began, that day in his office and with your research. So that was a couple of years ago this all began. Yes. You're better today. Are there volume switches? Can you, if you have a glass of wine, if you have a sandwich or pasta, does it tend to come back on you? 100%, but really? I don't. I don't. Yeah, so you I'm really. I'm so cautious. I mean, I do slip up every once in a while. Did you, did you take antifungal prescriptions? I still am taking them. You're still one. taking them. Okay, good. Do I you am. take supplements? You mentioned glutathione. I do. I do. Such a good one. And he's such a good doctor. And by the way, through these lectures, there are so many doctors around America now who are understanding that everything isn't bacteria. Does that just frustrate you now? Terribly. And it scares me. It worries me for people. So it, what are you doing about it? What do you do now? I am doing research and trying to advocate and spread the word through donating time in different support groups and really just trying to help people with and without diagnosed diseases take a look at their, I like to call it their fungal profile. <laughs> it's amazing. Suzanne Giliotti uh, is a registered nurse who is slowly, at two years, I too is just pulling myself out. A few years down the line, yeah. you'll be so much better. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. It was really, really Okay, hey, you've heard that old saying, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again. Problem is, as we age, we can't pick ourselves up. That ad on TV just goes in my brain all the time. Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. That woman's my age or younger. Folks, falling down as we age, there's no handrails, you fall down. Falling down can be bad. Getting up can be impossible. What I told my producer, John Miller, and I as we age, he's 71, I'm 69, as we age, go down, get back up, try this four or five times, lay down on your back, swing over and get back up again. I know this sounds crazy, and if you're 30 watching this right now, you're invincible anyway. You don't need to do this. But as we age, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and walk away. Start all over again. This is a good exercise. Try it once. And within a few months, you'll probably be doing this seven or eight times in repetition, up and down, up and down. We're going to fall down one day. The question is, can we get back up? Friends, welcome aboard. Let's talk a little bit about a neurological disease. When I was a kid, there were 10 of them. Now there's hundreds and hundreds of neurological diseases. What's the difference? I truly believe that antibiotics play a role. Antibiotics are mycotoxins, fungal metabolites, that can be neurotoxic. So when we're talking about Parkinson's, that's a disease where the neurons are poisoned by something. We don't know what that something is. My guess is that mycotoxins, and there's some science behind all of this, and I'll share that with you, play a very large role in this. Okay, let's start on a paper I just read the other day. Here was the headline on it. Parkinson's disease may start in the gut. This comes off of Science Daily, and it says one interesting finding was that cells in the gut's nervous system are involved in Parkinson's disease, indicating that the disease may start there. How many of you have watched this show for a period of time and heard me say 50 times, I think headaches, I think nervous problems, I think cancer, I think diabetes, I think they start in the gut. Antibiotics are indiscriminate bacteria killers, but God put a few pounds of good bacteria here. When you got an inner ear infection or a bladder infection and you swallow an antibiotic, it doesn't fall to the bladder or move up to the ear, it goes to the gut and the good bacteria is killed also. But there are other fungi, I believe, involved in the disease we call Parkinson's. Folks, if you drink alcohol, if you eat a lot of grains, cereals, if you take a lot of antibiotics, I think you're setting yourself up, I think, you're setting yourself up for serious neurological diseases, okay? So let's start here. What causes Parkinson's disease? 
And I went to the Parkinson's uh, News Today website. Parkinson's disease is caused by impairment or death of neurons in a region of the brain which controls the body's balance and movement. Okay, that, that makes sense. What would poison the neurons in a person's nervous system? Folks, that's my question because if we could figure that out, uh, if, if I had 10 people sitting here with Parkinson's, I would say, do you drink alcohol? How many antibiotics? When did you start? Well, I started when I was 10 years old for acne and, you know, um, what's your diet like? Well, I eat cereal or a bagel every morning, eat lots of grains, I drink a glass of wine with dinner every... If you always do what you've always done, expect the same results. Change is in order, okay? Okay, some fungal mycotoxins are poisonous to human neurons and the nervous systems. Others are tremorogenic and therefore fully capable of causing tremors and seizures, okay? These are a plentiful. When I did this study for the doctors, I found six or seven tremorogenic mycotoxins. It's amazing that our neurologists have no idea. Here's what was fun. In the audience were some neurologists. They were the nicest people you had ever met. They came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I, what are you saying here? That uh, antibiotics, antibiotics are important. They can be life-saving when used, and I'm gonna use this word, judiciously. Most are not being used judiciously, says the Center for Disease Control, okay? We have to start putting our thinking caps on in medicine and stop being so robotic. Prescription, prescription. Well, he's got three health problems. Well, then he needs three prescriptions. Okay. What is a Parkinson's tremor? And this comes off the same website, Parkinson News Today. A tremor is an involuntary, uncontrollable muscle contraction which manifests in shaking the, in body parts, most commonly the hands. About 70% of Parkinson's disease patients experience tremors in the early stages of the disease. Man, if we only knew what was tremorogenic, what was causing that. Let me go on. It is possible, says the Journal of Neurological Sciences 14 years ago in 2006, and I quote, it is possible that low-dose exposure to acrotoxin A will result in an earlier onset of Parkinson's. So for these doctors, I went on. Acrotoxin A is a mycotoxin produced by uh, several fungal species, including aspergillus mold, and there's that word, penicillium. Acrotoxin A impregnates cereal grains and dried fruits and shelled nuts. Penicillium? You mean, Doug, just a question. My husband had to take penicillin for years and years for infections. Could that have affected his gait, his, you know, his uh, tremors? Yes. Not according to Doug, according to the Journal of Neurological Sciences. The sad news is I don't know a neurologist who now puts Parkinson's patients on antifungal medication and the Kaufman diet. I don't know one. Should they? I think. If fungus is, is fungus the cause of Parkinson's? Early uh, in life was the person exposed to mold, sleeping in a basement, etc. Does he crave sugar? Hence the gut link to Parkinson's disease, like the initial graphic said. Does he take rounds of antibiotics, or has he? Were they hooked on corn, peanuts, alcohol? Each of these exposes us to fungal mycotoxins, and we now know that high exposure to fungal mycotoxins kills neurons and can cause tremors. Can I get an amen? It's all out there, folks. Your doctor has to put together the pieces of this very complex puzzle. Maybe help a lot of patients. Hope that helps. Mike asked the question, I have type 2 diabetes. By the way, that's sometimes lifestyle driven, Mike. It's things we're doing to ourselves. High kidney function and active RA, rheumatoid arthritis. I'm in pain, please help. I like the fact you're looking at the big picture. Help me with this pain. Not another anti-inflammatory, another aspirin, another NSAID. 
What's the cause? So many people live in pain without knowing they're much more in charge than they think. They go to a doctor, they get some kind of pain medication, and for four hours at a time, as long as I swallow that pill, I'm out of pain until I take another pill and another and another. What's the cause? Did you know, Mike, that we give rats diabetes by injecting baflomycin or streptozotocin? These are antibiotics. We inject mycotoxins into these rats, and over a period of time, we inoculate them. They get diabetes. Wait a minute, are we getting these mycotoxins in our body? Here's why I suspect that in your case. Rheumatoid arthritis, could it be mycotic? Mycotic arthritis, fungal arthritis is known to exist. So if you've got type two diabetes, blood sugars waxing and waning, kidney function that's you know off, and you have uh, active rheumatoid arthritis, think fungus. I'd ask my doctor if I could get Sporinox, 100 milligrams, and Nystatin, 500,000 IU, a couple times a day with meals. And then the meal would be the magic part of this. Mike, I can tell you with certainty that you've got a 50% chance of 30 days from now, not suffering like you are, not being in pain. Fungi live inside our joints, they can live in our kidneys, they can live everywhere. And we now know that they induce diabetes in laboratory animals. What about us? Take the challenge. Go on the Kaufman diet. I've written a book. Dr. Uh, Holland and I wrote a book 15 years ago called The Fungus Link to Diabetes. You might pick that up, review it, look at the diet, and give it a try. So you see, my friends, if you're eating a good, wholesome diet, not a lot of fast foods, you know, anything in moderation except moderation itself, or unless you're very, very sick. If I had a disease like diabetes, type one or type two diabetes, if I had lupus, if I had cancer or heart disease, I don't think anything in moderation would apply. I don't want a hamburger and french fries, right? I don't want the damage to be done inside my body with foods like that when I can eat foods with sulforaphane in it that really helps my body get better. How do you learn more about this? Every, I've committed. Television is one thing, but there's no personal interaction with you and me on television. And hundreds of people have written to our office and said, how can I communicate directly with Doug? In 1999, working clinically with all these doctors, I just said, the bigger audience is for me. 30 minutes, 45 minutes at a time with each one of their patients just didn't do the rest of the world good. So what I now do is something called social media. Every Tuesday and Thursday, from 3 to 4 p.m. on Tuesday, 2.30 to 4 p.m. Central Time, Dallas Time, you can communicate with me. I go on Facebook, I go on YouTube, social media, I'm talking to you live right here on this set, and you can type in questions, and I'll try and answer as many of them as I can. We really want to broaden the base of this show, really give you information that will help, and good foods like spinach dip. God bless you. Great to be with you today.